Hello everyone. Welcome to module 4 of the GPU teaching kit. We're going to cover memory and data locality in this module. We'll start with lecture 1 where we introduce the, uh, some subtleties of the CUDA memory types. The objective of this lecture is to learn to effectively use the CUDA memory types in a parallel program. We'll start by analyzing the importance of memory access efficiency and analyze how the memory access throughput can be a limiting factor of the execution throughput of a massively parallel processor. We then go over registers, shared memory, and global memory with an emphasis on the scope and lifetime of variables declared in these memory types. We will be using the image blur kernel to illustrate the importance of memory access efficiency. The arrow points to the most important statement in terms of execution time in the image blur kernel. It is within a doubly nested for loop, and with each iteration of that inner loop, the statement will be accessing one input element and accumulate the input element value into the pixel value, pixel val variable. This leads to a ratio of one memory access per uh, floating point addition operation. Now we are ready to analyze the importance of memory access efficiencies for the image blur kernel. All the threads access global memory for their input matrix elements. We saw from the previous slide that we need to do one memory access, one operand access from global memory for each floating point addition. And these memory accesses are four bytes each. So we need to have four bytes per second of memory bandwidth for each floating point operation per second throughput that we would like to accomplish. Assume that we have a GPU with a peak floating point execution rate of 1600 gigaflops and is equipped with 600 gigabytes per second of DRAM bandwidth, which is fairly typical ratio between the execution throughput and the DRAM bandwidth for modern GPUs. In order to achieve peak floating point per second rating for the image blur kernel, we need to be able to provide 1600 giga operands to the processor per second, and each one is four bytes. So we need to be able to provide four times 1600, which is 6400 gigabytes per second to the processor. Unfortunately, we only have 600 gigabytes per second of bandwidth from the DRAM to the processor. So this will limit the execution rate to 600 divided by 4, which is 150 gigaflops. Obviously, this is a very disappointing execution throughput. So 150 gigaflops of throughput limited by the memory bandwidth is only 9.3% of the peak floating point execution rate of the device. If we want to be able to get anywhere close to the 1600 gigaflops rating for the processor when executing image blur kernel, we want to drastically cut down the memory accesses. As it turns out, the use of special memory types to improve the memory access efficiency of image blur uh, kernel is somewhat complicated. And uh, we're going to come back to the image blur kernel in one of the parallel computation pattern uh, modules in the future. Here we introduce a slightly simpler example matrix multiplication and use, we will use that as the uh, basic example for introducing the effective use of CUDA memory types. Matrix multiplication is a computation between two matrices. Here we show M matrix multiplied by M matrix. In order to cal calculate the output matrix P, every element of the output matrix P 
is the inner product of uh, one row of m as we're showing in the horizontal direction uh, arrow and one column of n as we are showing in the vertical strip and the vertical arrow in this slide. Here we show a basic matrix multiplication kernel. Since we're producing a two-dimensional output P array, we can just have one thread to produce uh, one element of the output P array. This is the same as uh, the image blur kernel or the color to gray image conversion kernel. We calculate the row index and the column index uh, for the uh, P element that a, a particular thread is responsible for. And the pattern is identical to that in the, uh, in the in color to gray image conversion kernel. For matrix multiplication, the row index of the output P element is also the index for the M row that will be used in the, in, uh, in the inner product. And the column index of the P element is also the uh, column of the N uh, matrix that will be used in the inner product. So the, um, the core computation of the matrix multiplication uh, kernel for each thread. Um, we see the familiar pattern where the, um, each thread is going to check whether its row index and the column index are both within the valid range of the output P matrix. And once it determines that it's in the uh, valid output uh, range of the uh, P elements, then uh, you will perform the inner product that uh, will access uh, each element in the row of M and the corresponding element in the column of N, and then uh, do a multiplication and accumulate that uh, product into the temporary sum P value. And after um, the for loop iterates through all the elements of the M row and N column, then uh, it's, uh, it will write the P value out to the uh, particular uh, element position in P. Here we use a toy example to illustrate the operation of the, uh, the some basic matrix multiplication kernel. We, here we illustrate the um, assignment of threads to the P uh, data elements. Uh, we see that uh, we're using a very small uh, thread block, which is two by two. And then uh, uh, we also uh, show a very small grid, which is also two by two. So the, uh, in this configuration, we can calculate a uh, matrix multiplication of matrices that are four elements by four element, and uh, it will produce a uh, four by four output matrix. And here we, show, we see that block zero, zero is mapped into the upper left corner of the product uh, elements, P00, P01, P10 and P11. And within block 00, we see the thread mapping where uh, thread 00 maps to block uh, P00, and thread 10 maps to uh, product uh, P element P10. And we can also go to block 11. And um, uh, we see that uh, uh, for block 11, the uh, thread 00 of the block maps to P element P22 and uh, thread uh, 1, 1 in the, uh, in the block 1, 1 uh, actually maps to P element P33. So uh, in, uh, in the discussion, we're also going to uh, use the uh, terminology uh, block width, which is essentially um, the size of the thread block in uh, each direction, both the x and y direction. We are going to be using square matrix multiplication, that is um, the x dimension of y dimension of these matrices are identical. In uh, practice, uh, the matrices don't have to be square. And um, uh, for rectangular matrix multiplication, everything that we discuss are very much applicable. 
It's just that uh, we will need to have the width of the x dimension and the width of the y dimension explicitly uh, specified in all the kernels. So um, the uh, readers, uh, for uh, we should encourage all the students to uh, to do that as a exercise. This slide illustrates the calculation of the p elements. Uh, we use the calculation of p element p00 and p element p01 uh, to il illustrate the computation. When we calculate p00, uh, we need to do an inner product of row 0 of n and column 0 of n. And this is illustrated with these two uh, arrows, one horizontal and one vertical going through the row and column of the in input matrices. In order to calculate uh, P1, uh, P01, we're going to need to use row 0 of n and uh, uh, column 1 of n. And so this is uh, shown as the second set of arrows. And we see that um, uh, the calculation of both elements will use the same row of n, but different columns of n, and which will become useful uh, when we discuss the memory access efficiency of uh, the uh, matrix multiplication. Now that we have introduced the matrix multiplication example, uh, we're ready to look at the special memory types in CUDA. Let's review what we have learned so far. We have learned the use of global memory and uh, registers in the uh, in CUDA kernels. And these correspond to the memory and the register file in the von Neumann model. And we uh, highlighted the memory and the register file in the picture. This slide shows the programmer view of the CUDA memories. And uh, we see that uh, for uh, every uh, grid, there is global memory, and now we have an additional memory type called constant memory. And the global memory and constant memory are both accessible from the host, as we're showing in the black horizontal arrows between host and global memory and constant memory. Each thread block can have access to uh, sh a, sh a new memory type called shear memory. And this is uh, shown as a uh, shear memory box in each block. And the thread, each thread in the block can have direct access as shown as the vertical uh, arrows between the thread and the shear memory. Of course, uh, the threads can uh, still have access to their private registers. Uh, these are shown as the private register boxes uh, for each thread, and there is a direct uh, access arrow between the threads and their registers. This slide shows how we can declare CUDA variables so that they will reside in each type of memory. We will start with registers. In order to declare a variable to re reside in a register, we declare it as an automatic variable in a kernel. Here we show as an example, uh, we declare the integer local var, and um, uh, this variable will be placed into register as long as that declaration is in a kernel. And for each variable type, we're going to show the scope and lifetime of those uh, variables. Scope specifies the visibility of the variable whether it's visible to a particular thread, or it's visible to all the threads in a block, or it's visible to uh, all the threads in a grid. Lifetime specifies the, uh, ex uh, this, the span of the ex uh, variable's existence. Um, so whether the uh, variable exists only during the execution uh, period of a thread, or is, um, it has the same uh, lifetime as a thread block, or it exists throughout the entire execution uh, of the application. So uh, for register variables, the scope of the variable is, a is the thread that it corresponds to. 
So whenever we declare a register variable, it will be there will be one version for every thread in the grid. And uh, the lifetime of uh, the register variables will be identical to the lifetime of the thread. So uh, the variable, these variables will begin to exist when the uh, corresponding thread begins to execute, and they will cease to exist when the corresponding thread finishes execution. The second uh, type of uh, variables is shear variables. Whenever we declare a uh, variable as un uh, with a keyword underscore underscore sheared underscore underscore inside the kernel, we declare a shear memory variable. Uh, we can also optionally add a underscore underscore device underscore underscore keyword in front of it to make it clear that it's a, uh, it's a uh, in the uh, device shear memory. The shear memory variables are placed into the shear memory. And the scope of these variables are, uh, is going to be block. That is, um, every block has its own version of the shared memory variable. All the threads in that block will be reading and writing to the same version of the shared variable. It doesn't mean that they're going to see the necessarily see the uh, most up-to-date written ver uh, value in the shear variable, as we uh, shear memory variable, uh, we will need to use barrier synchronization in order to uh, to uh, assure that behavior. And um, the lifetime of a shear memory variable is going to be blocked. That is, um, the shear memory variable will begin to exist when the corresponding block begins to execute, and um, uh, the shear memory variable will cease to exist when the corresponding block finishes execution. The third type of uh, variables is global memory variable. If we declare a, uh, a variable with a keyword underscore underscore device underscore underscore outside the kernel functions, then uh, they become global memory variables. Um, the, the scope of these variables will be for the entire grid. So there will be only one version of this variable. Um, all the threads across all the grids will be actually seeing this, uh, the, the same version of the variable, even though they may not see the most up-to-date written value into these global variables. That requires explicit synchronization and, and or uh, kernel termination. And we would uh, uh, come back to this point uh, in a future slide. And then uh, the lifetime of these variables will be actually through uh, the entire application. So the, uh, the values in these variables will be, uh, would, uh, exist all the way until the end of the application. Finally, uh, we have the constant memory types. So if we declare a variable uh, with uh, a underscore, underscore, constant, underscore, underscore, outside the kernel functions, then uh, uh, this variable becomes a constant memory variable. And we can also optionally add underscore, underscore, device, underscore, underscore to, um, to clarify that uh, these variables are in the device constant memory. The scope of constant variables is the entire grid. That is, all the threads can see the same constant. That therefore, uh, there's only one version of the constant variable. And uh, the lifetime of the constant variable is the whole application. Um, they would begin, uh, they would uh, only uh, exist, uh, they will exist all the way to the end of the uh, applica uh, execution for that application. Here we show a very quick example of declaring um, a shear memory variable in a kernel. So the, for example, if we want to declare a shear memory variable in the blur uh, kernel, we can just add uh, the, the put a declaration underscore underscore shared underscore underscore, and then we are declaring a two-dimensional array. Um, we place ds device shear in front of the, the, the array name just to clarify that it's in the shared memory. And uh, it's, this is optional, just a naming convention to, uh, for our own benefit. 
So here we are declaring a floating point two-dimensional array of tile width um, elements in each dimension. And um, in CUDA, uh, whenever we declare a shear memory with known uh, size at compile time, in this case we are putting in the compile time constant tile width and, uh, in, into the dimensions of the shear, uh, shear array, and we can use two-dimensional uh, notation because we uh, the compiler knows the size of the uh, of the array dimensions at compile time. This is a quick review of uh, where we should declare uh, each type of memory uh, uh, variables. So uh, the a quick uh, way of determining where to place the dec uh, declaration is to ask whether the host can access the value. So uh, the host needs to be able to transfer data in and out of the global memory and the constant memory through APIs. So that's why um, these global uh, memory types and the constant memory types uh, uh, variables need to be declared outside of any kernel function. Whereas um, the registers and shear memory are not accessible by the host and they're strictly accessed by the, th uh, the threads and uh, so they are going to be declared in the kernel and the difference between the two is um, the uh, shear memory variables are on a block basis and registers are private to each thread. And we will see that um, the effective use of the shear memory is really going to enable the data sharing and the uh, data exchange between uh, threads in a thread block. So now let's talk a little bit more about the shear memory uh, in CUDA. The shear memory is really a special type of memory whose contents are explicitly defined and used in the kernel source code. Remember, the shear memory variables have the same lifetime as the thread block. So um, when the thread block begins execution, that's when the shear ver memory variable begin to exist. That's why um, all, the, uh, all the shear memory variables need to be explicitly initialized uh, during the execution of the uh, kernel. And so um, we, we have one version of the, uh, a shear memory variable uh, for uh, each thread block. Physically, the implementation is such that there's one shear memory, uh, hardware shear memory for in each shear mem uh, in each SM streaming multiprocessor, and this single um, physical shear memory is divided uh, into the different versions uh, partitioned across the thread blocks that are assigned into the uh, into the streaming multiprocessor. So this is part of the dynamic resource partitioning that we uh, discussed in a previous lecture. They're accessed at uh, each higher speed uh, in terms of both latency and throughput than global memory. And um, the, the, uh, late, the access speed is typically um, at least one order of magnitude, if not two orders of magnitude, uh, faster than the global memory. The scope of access and the sharing are thread blocks, and um, you know the, this is a very important uh, aspect of the shared memory. The shared memory it really is there to enable very high throughput, low latency data exchange uh, between threads in a thread block. The lifetime of these uh, variables are uh, thread blocks. The contents will disappear after the corresponding thread. Uh, thread block finishes uh, execution. So uh, that's why if we want to preserve the contents of the shear ver uh, memory variables, we need to store them into a global memory variable uh, at the end of the execution of a thread block. And um, for those um, uh, students who are familiar with computer architecture, shear memory is a form of scratch pad memory. And uh, these variables are uh, explicitly, still needs to be explicitly loaded and uh, uh, stored with memory access instructions. 
and th uh, that's why they're fundamentally different at, uh, from the registers which can be accessed as part of the arithmetic instructions as we discussed in the previous lecture. This slide shows a hardware view of the CUDA memories. We see that the shear memory is, uh, there's one uh, copy of the hardware shear register in the SM, uh, which is the processor box. And um, uh, there are multiple processing units in the, uh, in the SM, and all these processing units will be running threads, and these, uh, they will all have access to the same physical shared memory. And um, uh, the, when there are multiple thread blocks assigned to each SM, um, the shared memory resource will be dynamically partitioned um, across these thread blocks. And we also see that, that the global memories outside uh, the processor SM and all the uh, processing units also have access to the global memory. And within each processing unit, there is a register file. And uh, also keep in mind that uh, the processing unit could be ex uh, process, uh, executing multiple threads uh, during the, uh, concurrently. So the register file needs to be dynamically partitioned across all the threads assigned to each processing unit. So this is also part of the dynamic partitioning of resources. This completes uh, lecture 4.1. Thank you.